Shirley asked me to give a micro lecture on quantum mechanics, which is kind of like asking for someone to quickly describe jazz. But I'll give it a whirl, and don't worry if you're confused at the end. If you think you understand quantum mechanics, then you probably don't. Now, I'm coming at this as a chemist, which can be different from the other sciences. There's a rough hierarchy with mathematicians considering themselves to be the most pure science. Then, physicists use math to explain the real world. Chemists use physics. Biologists use chemistry. And then the social sciences, they make a lot of stuff up since humans often don't behave according to physical laws. This also is a different type of internet cat meme, as you'll see in a moment. Now, Shirley asked me to include this image as the boss of my day job introduces me as an oddball. The reason being, I used to be a chemist, but now by day I do virtual and augmented reality research and development. But by night, I'm a musician playing in a number of bands around Los Angeles, including my group, No Static. Please go to iTunes and buy our album. And to add to the oddity, it turns out that some of the seminal work on quantum mechanics actually was done in the 1960s by the comedy group Firesign Theater, highlighted in their album, How Can You Be in Two Places at Once When You're Not Anywhere at All? And here you see the collision of science, politics, comedy, and music. Now, the internet exists for cats, and it turns out that so does quantum mechanics. I'll frame it today with talk of probabilities and a lot of maybes, but the cat will be a recurring theme. Back in the late 1600s, Sir Isaac Newton did a pretty good job of explaining the physical world. He and others invented a variety of math, including calculus, to come up with theories of mechanics. For large-ish objects, Newtonian physics does a very good job at predicting outcomes. But when you shrink down to the atomic and subatomic level, it starts to fall apart. And in fact, this image foretells one of the things that would start to break his theories, that being light. Turns out that he also was ahead of his time with rock album cover design. Newton described light as particles called corpuscles. In the early 1800s, though, Thomas Young did what's called the double slit experiment, which indicated that light in fact behaved like a wave. Now, if it were a particle running through slits like this, you wouldn't expect to see diffraction patterns. That's a wave thing. Not a problem, though. Science is always refining and redefining theories as more experiments are performed and knowledge accumulates. Then towards the end of the 19th century, people shined light on a varying wavelengths on a piece of potassium and found that only certain colors of light would eject an electron from the metal. This again started to turn physics upside down. Why only certain wavelengths? This is more particle-like. This led to the so-called wave-particle duality of light. The other implication was that only certain energies would eject electrons. This meant that current atomic structure theories were probably insufficient. Atoms are the smallest contained unit of matter. The Bohr model has an electron circling a nucleus somewhat like a tiny universe. The orbitals had different sizes and hence different energies associated with them. You could pump energy in and excite an electron to a higher energy orbital. When it falls back down to the lower energy state, it ejects a photon, which is a massless bundle of energy. This results in light with a difference in energy related to the wavelength or color. This is all very particle-like, but we're still stuck with this data that shows that light is both particle and wave. So how can we rectify this? In the early 1900s, Erwin Schrödinger came along and invented some more new math to explain the atomic and subatomic behavior. Basically, instead of thinking of the electron as a particle rotating around the nucleus, instead, he described it as a density with certain probability of being found in certain places. For a given atom, you could have wave equations with possible solutions which result in certain shapes of probabilities of electron density. This was starting to mix wave and particle behavior. And the math was good at predicting whether or not atoms would form bonds with each other. You run into a problem, though. If you actually try and measure the position of the electron for a given atom under a given set of conditions, you no longer have a probability, but rather you have an answer. Before you measure it, the electron can be almost anywhere, but afterwards, those possibilities collapse into a single location, and you don't know if you've influenced that situation. This leads to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which states that for very small things, you can know the momentum or the position, but not both. 
If you try and figure it out, you will perturb that very small thing and influence the outcome of the event. So in effect, you've ruined the ending of the movie. And this can impact personal relationships as well. And so we're back to cats. This is Schrodinger's thought experiment with a cat in his diabolical machine. The way that this works is there's a radioisotope that will decay in an unknown time. When it decays, which is a random possibility, it trips a hammer which smashes a vial of poison which kills the cat. You seal the cat up in the box and then try to figure out if the cat is alive or dead. Since the isotope decay is random, you can't predict when it will happen. And if you try to open the box, you might disturb the hammer, perturbing the system and influencing the event. So at any given time, is the cat alive or dead? Well, one answer is the cat is both alive and dead. And another answer is that he's neither alive nor dead, but in some alternate quantum state. So what does this have to do with Shirley's work? Well, one way to frame quantum mechanics is Everett's many worlds interpretation. So for instance, if I take a deck of cards and pull the queens out and stand them on their side, they can fall in one of two ways, face up or face down. If I consider all four of them, I can calculate a probability of the 16 different combinations. And if I did the actual experiment enough times, those numbers would likely play out over the long run. But if I only do it once, essentially collapsing the wave equation, I'll come up with a single answer. Before they fall over it though, Everett would argue that all possibilities exist. Another way to think of this is say a man and a woman meet in a bar. Their encounter could lead to a number of possible futures, and before she decides to have that drink or not, all of the futures may in fact exist. The collapse of the wave equation may exterminate those alternative futures, depending on the observer's viewpoint, or it may just hide them from that individual, and they may exist for others. So perhaps, both of them actually happened, and it is more of a question of what reality we are tuned into. Hopefully this has shed some light on things, but maybe not. At any rate, we can find solace in the words of one of my heroes, Richard Feynman. One of the most brilliant physicists ever, he is also a very funny and down-to-earth person. He also was a realist and a pragmatist, observing that physics is like sex. Sure, it may give some practical results, but that's not why we do it. Thanks. Thank you.